Hello, and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Janieri, and this is Great Big History Podcast. We continue our History 102, history from 1500 to 2022 or so, uh, with Episode 4, The Ottoman Turks, from Sublime, Sublime Port to Sick Man of Europe. So, there's a country which American kids snicker at, of course, that's called Turkey. And it's the land of the Turks. Now, here's the thing. The Turks weren't always there. It was a land called Anatolia. And it was a land that the Romans called Asia Minor. The Turks arrived, the Turkish-speaking peoples, who were nomadic horse peoples from Central Asia, arrived around 1,000 or so A.D. and began moving into this Greek-speaking Christian land. Anatolia, Asia Minor, was part of Europe. It was part of the Greek world. It was part of the uh, Roman world. It was the land of a 1,000 cities to the, to the Romans. Now, it had been part of the Hittite world, which was tied to Mesopotamia through trade. It was part of the Persian world. And so Asia Minor, Anatolia, Turkey, has been more than any other place a crossroads of the world. And it has flipped from being European in its culture to being Asian and Middle Eastern in its culture. And in its trade, in its direction. Well, the group of Turks we're going to talk about in this chapter is the Ottomans. And the Ottomans start out as a small little tribe among lots of other tribes of Turks, all fighting it out after the Mongols came in and smashed the Sejuk Turks, who seemed right on the edge of turning Asia Minor into Turkey. The Sejuk, uh, S-E-J-U-K um, or K-U-K, I'd have to write it down to know how to spell it. And writing in the air doesn't quite work. Um, but the Sejuks were the people, were the tribe that led the Turks into Asia Minor, beat up the Byzantines, and began converting Asia Minor into Turkey. Well, the Mongols showed up. The Arabs had told the Mongols that the Turks were really, really tough. And so the Mongols said, oh, yeah, we'll see about that. They came into Asia Minor, smashed the Sejuk Turks, and splintered the Turkish tribe into, you know, 30, 40 different little countries. One of those is the Ottoman, the tribe of Osman, O-S-M-A-N. And so the Ottoman destruction of the Sejuk, S-E-J-U-K, ha allowed for smaller tribes' independence. Now, why don't the Byzantines, why doesn't the Roman Empire just suck all this stuff up? Finally, the, the, their, the Byzantine prayers have been answered. The Turkish onslaught that has been conquering Asia Minor, has been taking their land from them, has been defeated. Whew! Now, like a vacuum cleaner, you should just be able to suck it all up, right? Well, the Byzantines aren't. Why? Because of other Christians, because Catholics showed up. Because in 1204, Christian Europeans, Catholics, on their fourth crusade, who were supposed to go to Jerusalem, decided instead to sack Constantinople. They've effectively liquidated all the money that the Byzantines had, and stole it and took it back to Italy and ended any chance the Byzantine Greeks or were ever going to recapture Asia Minor and recover it from for Christianity. Now, remember, if you know your, your New Testament, this, this Christianity in Asia Minor goes back to Paul, the letters to the Galatians. And goes from then until the 1100s. So this is one of the oldest Christian places on earth. 
It's just second or third after Jerusalem, right? After Judea. It's some of the oldest Christianity on earth, and it's being wiped out. Why were the Ottomans the successful one? Because now there's like 30 different tribes, right? Why are they the ones that we're going to be talking about and not the other ones? And the answer is, is that the Ottomans picked up a Byzantine Roman concept. They were willing to employ both Turks and other peoples, especially Byzantine Christians. And that was very unusual. They were willing to employ other peoples, foreign peoples, people outside their tribe, and treat them well. So despite being uneducated, poor horse warriors, they adopted cannon and gunpowder very early. And so they had a military advantage against those who were unwilling to change, right? You adopt cannon, you adopt, uh, adopt gunpowder, you need to change how your army works, you need to employ more infantry, you need to hire people who are not you, because your people are best on the horses shooting bows and arrows. That's where they're good at war. They're not good at infantry. You can't just take them off the horse and plop them in an infantry unit and say, go at it. You're, you're losing their ability. You're losing their specialty. So the Ottomans were willing to change. And that gave them an advantage against people who weren't who were too conservative. So what was the Ottoman's ultimate goal? Was to turn the Hagia Sophia, the largest Christian church in the world, into that. If you're watching the video, it's from the largest Christian world, church in the world to that, the largest mosque in the world. That was their goal, to capture Constantinople, to capture Rum, R-U-M, the new Rome. That had been the goal of the Umayyads. It had, it's a goal in the Quran. That Islam had to at some point capture Rome. Had to at some point capture Rome. Now you get some people who don't understand what they're reading. Westerners, you know, Europeans, Christians. Who think of when in the Quran it says Rome. It says Rum, R-U-M. They think Italy. That's not what it means. Constantinople was not called Constantinople by the people in Constantinople. It was called Rome, the new Rome. And so the Muslims, the Turks, can't say Rome, so they say Rum. And so their goal is to capture and to convert Constantinople from a Christian capital into an Islamic one. The Queen of Cities the greatest city in the world since the 300s until 1204. Now, it's still independent, but it was just wrecked in 1204. It was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, of the Byzantine Empire. It controlled southeastern Europe and parts of the Middle East. It had massive walls. That's the thing that will defend it. Truly just massive walls. When Theodosius, when Constantine first built this city, but Theodosius then built the, the circuit of walls, they were built to keep a Roman army out so that a Roman army would never be able to capture the city. Now, you have to understand, the Romans were the greatest besiegers in history, in the ancient world, in the medieval world, really. Until the invention of gunpowder, nobody could capture a city better than the Romans. They were just stunningly professional. The, the most, there's two major uh, examples of this, which was the encirclement in Gaul uh, that Caesar has against Asservenergix, um, where they laid siege to the capital of the, the Golic kingdom. And then a Gaul, Golic army, came to relieve that city. So this is bad because if you're, you're Caesar, you have armies on both sides of you. Well, what they did was dig in and they created a fortification that was facing not only in, but facing out as well. 
And then they won the battle. So these massive walls, the, the second, the other part is the siege at Masada, uh, the great, during the great Jewish revolt in 70, 71, 72 AD, where um, Herod, H-E-R-O-D, Herod had built a safe room, a safe palace. He was so disliked by his Jewish subjects that he knew sooner or later they were going to revolt. And so he built a palace on a plateau, on a mesa, that you needed like elevators to go up to, to get there. I mean, it is meant to be unassailable. Well, during the Jewish revolt, about 200 uh, rebels captured it. They took it over. Herod has, was long since dead, so it was kind of just a palace that existed. And these Jewish rebels captured it, and they, they held out. They were like, as Jerusalem's getting destroyed, as Jeru Judah's getting destroyed, as the temple's being torn down, they held out. And then the Romans besieged it. And it's just steep walls. This is steep walls. And what the Roman army decided to do was build a mountain. They built a ramp. They just built a mountain that went up so they could bring up their siege equipment up to the palace. So it was just day after day after day. They built a mountain. And then brought their siege engines up, smashed on the walls, and captured it so that all the Jewish rebels killed each other. They all, they took lots because suicide is a great sin. So they took lots over who would kill who. And so when the Romans break in, all the, all the people are dead. All the families are dead. The men had killed their wives and their children. And then the men have killed each other. And the idea being uh, suicide was better than what the Romans were going to do to you. Anyway, um, massive walls. So the, the point I'm going to tell you is the Avars, the Huns, the Goths, all these people, the Slavs, the Turks, all failed trying to take the city. They have massive walls, Greek fire, which is napalm, right? It's science. This is the most important political objective in Islam. It's in the Quran. Capturing this city would make anybody instantly the man in Islam, the greatest people in Islam. So it makes sense that it's the goal. So what innovation did the Turks use to gain legitimacy for their rule? Well, they picked up from the Romans the concept of nashio, the willingness to employ anybody, Turk, Greek, Christian, Arab. They're willing to employ anybody who could help them. Plus, they picked up gunpowder, which we've already talked about. Cannons, then muskets. New technology, new education. They were willing to change, adopt new ideas, and change their own society to win. Meanwhile, at the exact same time, because of the Muslim conquest, Muslim, because of the Mongol conquest of the Muslim Arab world, the Arabs were becoming xenophobic. The Arabs were turning inwards, like the Ming do. They were turning in on themselves. That was their response to the trauma of the Mongols. So as the Arabs are receding from cultural leadership of the, of the Muslim world, now remember, that's a big deal. Muhammad is a Muslim. Muhammad is a Muslim. Of course he's a Muslim. Muhammad is an Arab. The Arabs are the chosen people. Allah did not send Gabriel to the Turks. Allah did not send Gabriel to the Persians. Allah sent Gabriel to Muhammad, and Muhammad was an Arab. So for the Turks to take on this leading role in Islam is a humiliation. It's one more thing that the Arab, that Arabic Islam has as a trauma, that not only did we lose, we're being replaced, that Allah is definitely mad at us. So the Ottoman army, good or bad, it's awesome. They employed Christian youth, who will later be known as the Janissaries, to fight infantry battles against other Christian infantry. This shows their willingness to change. Remember, the Turks are on horseback, and they are at a disadvantage when 
attacking infantry. Horses don't want to charge boxes of men holding spears. The only thing that can fight infantry is infantry, unless you bring in gunpowder and blow giant holes in that in that box of men, right? So cannon, the whiff of grape shot, as Napoleon will say, can break boxes of people. We just, you know, poof in a big red mist. We see this happen in the, in the American Civil War, be described all the time. They march up in their big squares. They're totally safe from cavalry. They're totally safe from horses charging at them, right? So what does the opposing army do? Bring up the cannon. That's, that's um, Pickett's charge, right? And if you've ever been to Gettysburg, and as a New Jersey and Pennsylvanian, you should definitely get yourself to Gettysburg just to walk, just to walk Getty's charge, just to have an idea of just how far it was. And then you had to look at those hills that you're walking to and realize they were covered in cannon. So, so they need somebody who's willing to charge into Christian European infantry. Well, the only people who know how to do that are other infantry. That's the Persians or other Christians. And so uh, the Ottomans are perfectly willing to hire Southern European Christians, you know, Slavs, Greeks, Byzantines, in order to do that. They're also willing to use gunpowder and the technology and the infrastructure and the logistics and the education and the training needing to needed to make cannon and then later muskets effective. So there's nobody else like them. They are the most disciplined, best armed army in the world by say 1400, 1500. And remember, you just don't get a gun. You didn't have to know how to build them. You have to make them. You need the technology. You need the gunpowder that you can make more of. You need the, the, the economic infrastructure to make tens of thousands of guns. You need the financial infrastructure so that the king can pay for it. You need the logistics so that you could get the supplies, the lead, the, the metal, the copper from all different places. You need the education. The Swedish, um, in the 1600s, the Swedish manual for how to properly use your rifle, your musket, it wasn't a rifle yet, it was a musket, had 42 steps in it. So you need to know what those steps are. You need to know how to reload. You need to know how, to, how the machine works. You also need training. Once you know, you need to do it over and over and over and over and over again so that you're effective doing it under fire. And the Turks were willing to make these investments. So there's nobody else like them. Absolutely nobody. The Janissaries become so trusted that they gain special privileges in the society because they're seen as more loyal. Remember, they are Christians. They're not Muslims. So this is weird right? That they're getting special privileges. They're seen as more loyal to the Sultan than fellow Muslims. So they make more money. And the Janissaries are able to defeat Europeans and able to defeat Arabs and their Arab revolts and the Turkish revolts. Because remember, not all, even though the Ottomans are going to conquer all of Turkey, not all Turks are Ottoman. Now, the Janissaries still can't fight the Mongols. Tamerlane, Mongol, Persians roll in in 1402 and smash the Turkish army. So the Mongols, even 150 years later, and this is a lot of has to do with Tamerlane at this point. Uh, he's he he is the general who is the asterisk to all of this who he's the exception that proves the rule um so it shows the turks still can't can't handle the mongols um but who could right um while while tamerlane is smashing india and the and the turks out there in in northeastern asia 
what's left of the Mongols of Mongolia are capturing the Chinese emperor. I mean, you know, at the same, at about the same time. So around 1400, the Mongols were on the move again. The effect of that was that even though the Turks will conquer Baghdad in the 1500s and conquer Egypt in 1517, they'll never really be able to take over Persia. Persia will remain an independent Muslim competitor, just like they were to the Byzantines, just like they were to the Romans. That Persia remains uh, the foundation of what will become Iran, remains this highly educated, highly developed, uh, Eastern, Western looking crossroads that will connect India, Central Asia, and the Middle East. And so the Turks and the Persians will have this ongoing hundreds of years of fighting, not continuously, but it's kind of like Britain and France. It just goes on. And, you know, if you're a sultan who needs a good war, you could always go fight the Persians. And a Persian a sultan who needed a good war could always have, you know, invade and try to capture Baghdad, right? There's was, there was always an excuse. All right. So what happened in the 1450s? Well, in the 1450s, they were able, the Turks were finally able to surround Constantinople. They, they were able to cross into Europe, defeat the Bulgars, defeat the Serbs, crush the Transylvanians. This is where we get Vlad the Impaler. You know, he's impaling Turks. You know, this is where we get dra- the this, this story of Dracula from. But the Turks win and they go up to the Danube River and then they turn around and they lay siege with giant cannon to Constantinople. And the Byzantines now reduced basically to their city and the suburbs call out for help. And the Italian Christian states, Genoa and Venice basically say, "Eh, it's over. They leave Constantinople to its fate. The Turks capture Constantinople not by smashing down the walls. The walls actually survive. The cannon was not enough to even destroy these Roman walls. That's now that's engineering, right? That is like some that's that's like a birdhouse grandpa made back in the day. They won by discovering an unlocked gate. The the Byzantines had sallied forth to relieve something, uh, some suburbs, or, you know, take advantage, to capture something. And when they returned back into the city, somebody didn't check the door. And they left it open. Some Turks find the gate unlocked, and they pour in. The capture of Constantinople is the end of the Roman Empire. This is where it truly ends. This is where Gibbon, the great historian of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire has the end. This is where he finishes. He doesn't take the Catholic supremacist idea that Rome fell in 476. He doesn't take, the despite being British, he doesn't take the Western-centric view that Rome was Italy. The idea was the Roman Empire in its culture still survived till 1453. Now, Constantinople becomes the only Christian capital to convert into a Muslim capital rather than build a new city. It's the only one. In North Africa, the Arabs and Berbers will build Tunis to replace Carthage. In Egypt, it's Cairo to replace Alexandria. In in the Middle East, it is Baghdad to replace Ctesiphon. Only Constantinople will be rebuilt as a Muslim capital. And I find that to be very interesting. That the Arab Muslims don't. They don't take the Byzantine or Roman capitals and use them. They build something new. But Constantinople was good enough. Was Suleiman really magnificent? And the answer is, heck yeah, he was. He combined military power. He smashes Hungary in 1526, which was the largest Catholic state in, in 
Eastern Europe and Central Europe. He besieges Vienna in 1529, which was the capital of the Holy Roman Empire, which is up in the Alps, by the way. Uh, the only thing that really kept him from capturing it was the rains. Uh, 1529 was a heavy, heavy rain year, and he left his heaviest cannon at home. He couldn't, they couldn't get it through the mud of Eastern Europe. So had he had his cannon, maybe he wins. So he had military power. He was the, the, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks under Suleiman the Magnificent were the most powerful military power in, in the world. Bar none. Bar none. Tamerlane was long dead. Uh, the Mughals are just maybe getting started in India. Um, the Ming were declining into civil war. The European states were a mess. Uh, Songhai in um, Saharan Africa was powerful against other Africans, but not able to project that power yeah, even to the coast of North Africa. So it didn't have the gunpowder, it didn't have the guns. So the largest military power in the world in 1520 is the Turks, by far. They had unmatched diplomatic power. They made an alliance with France against the Holy Roman Empire. They had trade with Italy. The Italians still wanted access to Constantinople's trade. They still wanted access to um, the what was left of Central Asian Indian Silk Road trade, what little was left coming out. Uh, and so it became Constantinople, Istanbul, became known as the Sublime Port. And it's funny because I were reading my archives, my Swedish archives in the 1600s, and they don't call it Istanbul, and they do not call it Constantinople. They call it the Sublime Port. And you're looking going, what the hell is a Sublime Port? And you're like, it's Constantinople. But see, Constantinople was a Christian city. So in Latin, when you read the Latin work, they call it Constantinople. But when you read the diplomatic stuff, it's called the Sublime Port. They don't call it Istanbul, which is kind of a, a, as a New Yorker, it makes sense to me. It's kind of a Greek slang term for uh, going to the city. And New Yorkers say this all the time. New Yorkers who are especially in the suburbs in Westchester or Long Island or New Jersey will say, I'm going to, this, to the city. And they mean New York, Manhattan. They really mean Manhattan. They don't even mean Queens or Brooklyn. But it's, I'm going to the city. So Istanbul is a mishearing of that by Turks who don't can't quite match the Greek language. Bull would be pole in Greek, right, for, for city, right? So, so the sublime port. And for with this comes this idea that the sublime port is exotic. It has a sexual liberty. They're not Christians, remember, so you don't have all those um, hang-ups about sex that Christianity does. Islam, like Judaism, does not think the body is particularly sinful. It thinks acts are sinful, not the body. Christianity thinks the body is sinful. You know, your body is a disgusting thing that you have to get rid of in order to enter heaven. Whether it's burned off in hell or slightly, slightly roasted away in purgatory, you have to get rid of the body. It's holding your, your soul down. That's not Islamic. And that's not Judy, Judaism. And so, um, there's a book that came out maybe 10 years ago, and it's called like, it's, it's got, a, got, a, got a title that hits you in the face. I think it's called like Kosher Sex. And the idea of this book, Kosher Sex, was not a Jewish handbook for sex, for how to have sex, but it was a attempt to de-Christianize Jewish views of the body. And the idea of kosher sex is 
the way the Old Testament looks, and if you read Song of Solomon, it's very clear that liberty, sexual liberty is part of this. But if you read the Old Testament, the idea of the book was there's nothing really there. There's rules about who you can and when you can, right? But for the most part, as long as you have a consentious, consenting relationship with another consenting adult, you could do anything. The body is there. The body was made by God to be enjoyed. If sex wasn't meant to be enjoyed, it wouldn't feel good. And so the idea of the body is it can't be bad. It was made by God. It was made in the image of God. So it can't be bad. Christians, on the other hand, were dealing with a Roman world that had vomitoriums, orgies, and by orgy in Roman, in Latin, it meant just too much, like a buffet. A breakfast buffet is an orgy of food. But of course, the, the Christians will turn orgy into a sexual thing. Forget the buffet. They don't care about the buffet. I go to Disney World and I could have three buffets a day. No, 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 no. Christianity turns it, they don't care about the food or the excess. You know, Walmart is an orgy of consumer products. No, 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 no. They mean it just as sex because sex is the thing that they worried about. So the Roman concept of the body was very free, very liberty. And so Christianity was fine against that as an alternative. And so the idea was the body was sinful. Well, Constantinople was the closest place where if you were a libertine, you wanted to do some, some kinky stuff, you could go. It gets this idea of exotic, sexual liberty, Eastern luxury, drugs, opium, uh, hashish that you couldn't get in Europe. And notice drugs are a major part of Orientalism, of this view of the East, of heroin, of, of sexual liberty, a bit of homosexuality being okay. Um, of luxury, you know, Persian rugs and silks. And it gives us this invention of Orientalism, the idea that the East is different than Europe. It's strange and exotic. Um, that's everything from, you know, the idea of the, of the opium then, that it's like sexy and seductive with its pillows laid out on the floor and all of these kind of hippies just kind of hanging out, being like zoned out, but doing, you know, vaguely pleasurable things, right? That's an idea of the Orientalism. So there's unmatched diplomatic power. There's also cultural power. He builds Constantinople into Istanbul. Now, uh, Mohammed II is the guy who captures Istanbul, captures Constantinople, and he starts the rebuilding, but it is really Suleiman who makes it into Istanbul, not Constantinople. Istanbul, not Constantinople. It's a long time gone, Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul. So he builds a Topkapi uh, top, top Palace, and he builds this massive palace that's going to be poetry and mosaics and dance and architecture and philosophical debate. It's a salon and an art gallery and a pleasure dome 150 years before Versailles. Constantinople becomes again what it was in 600 AD, in the, in the age of, of Justinian, a crossroads of Europe, Africa, and Asia. So what happened to the rulers after Suleiman? Well, we get 13 useless rulers in a row. And harem politics dominated. What's the harem? The harem is a palace, it's a sex palace full of women who you, as sultan, have sex with. And female power and their children's power is completely connected to how into you, the sultan is, and how not into the other girls, the sultan is. It's the bachelor. But in a world where instead of getting married, you can become 
uh, your child could become leader of the world. Or you could end up murdered and thrown into the river. And your child too. Like, the bachelor's cute with its roses. This is the real bachelor with real stakes. Because this is life and death. You lose at The Bachelor. You don't get to go home and write a book and get on the cover of People magazine. No, 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 no. You lose. Bad things happen to you and your family. So harem politics are vicious. These women are vicious because they're, they're fighting for their lives and they're playing for the world. Who control the world? They want their son to control the world, their children to control the world. So the other thing that happens is you also kill your younger brothers because you're worried about usurpation rather than talent. You're worried that they might get rid of you. So what happens is instead of using your brothers as generals and as governors and as, as using your family, the dynasty, the way the Romans did or the way China is excellent at doing, the Romans are okay at it, but the chi China is excellent. It does it over and over and over again. The Ottoman, in the end, just murder their brothers as a problem. So despite occasionally good emperors, you have long periods of stagnation and falling behind. So what a bunch of these useless rulers do, and what you could just do is go into the sex palace. You could just go into the pleasure palace and not come out. So who runs the show? The Grand Viziers do. Their kind of prime minister runs the government rather than the Sultan, who basically is, goes into the Pleasure Palace and says, you better have a really good reason for interrupting me in here. And oof, there he goes. And he might not come out for years. And remember, if you're the Grand Vizier and you knock on that door to, to, to ask him a question, you're already admitting you can't handle it. So do you think a Grand Vizier wants to do that? You know? So the Grand Viziers may be very good. The Sultan gets talent without risk of us usurpation. Like, the Grand Viziers can't become Sultan. They're not of the right family. They're not of the right lineage. So your grand viziers may be good, but they also may be bad because they don't have the sultan's legitimacy to fall back on. And they also have vested interest in helping their own family and friends. So what's good for the vizier may not be good for the empire. But remember, for a sultan, what's good for the sultan is good for the empire. Why? Because the sultan owns the empire. The vizier, on the other hand, runs the empire. So what's good for him may be bad for the empire. We see this with CEOs all the time. They do terrible things that will wreck the company, but the stock price goes up. And so when they get fired, they get a huge pay payout because the stock price went up. Boom. But the company has to fire 20,000, 30,000 workers. But if we get a series of good rulers and we figure out core politics, Things should get better and the Turks can conquer the world, right? This is the whole point of part one of this course is that they'll conquer the world, right? And the answer is no. Because of what happens to the Silk Road by 1600. By 1600, the Silk Road is completely shut down. By the Ming and the Central Asian cities that are wrecked, the Europeans go by sea to India, discover the Americas, get rich, and then reach China by sea. Istanbul's position in the world trade ends. There's less money for everything, for education, for technology, for the army, for the culture. So the very world that they grew up in, a world that in 14 or 1500 was still probably the best place to be, that crossroads of East and West. Now, if you take a look at the maps, on the left is the traditional Silk Road trade routes that go from Eastern Asia, across Central Asia, into India, into Persia, into the Middle East, into Constantinople, where the Europeans come, buy the goods, and go back to Europe and sell them. 
if you look at the right, that is the trade routes of the Dutch in 1650. And notice everything, 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 everything that's highlighted on the map on the left is avoided, has been gone around on the map on the right. So the Turks fall behind the Europeans and they keep getting poorer. Remember, we have terrible leaders who cannot stop this, who aren't interested in stopping it. They are perfectly happy with their pleasure palace budget. So what about the Turks and the Europeans? Well, what you get is a complete reversal of power from Suleiman's time. Uh, if you're watching a video, here comes one of my kings, the Swedish King Charles XII. The Swedish King Charles XII was defeated by the Russians at the Battle of Poltava. This is Tsar Peter. He's defeated deep inside the Ukraine. Deep inside Ukraine, excuse me. It's not the Ukraine, it's just Ukraine. He's defeated deep inside Ukraine at Poltava in 1709. He fled to Turkey. He fled to a, a city called Bender, where he kind of hung out for a while as kind of a prisoner and a like he, he's both under the Turkish protection because it's hard to get back to Sweden. He's have to go all the way around where the Russians armies are. And he looks at the army and says, it's magnificent. He declares his miss. He declares his army magnificent and it's leaders useless. He keeps going to the Sultan, attack the Russians, attack the Russians. Give me the army with your army, with command and the reform of the Ottoman army. He thought he could destroy the Russian problem forever. He could smash Peter's army, free Ukraine, save the Baltic from Russian Slavic conquest. In response to that, the Turks tried to kick him out before he attempted to just flat out take over the Ottoman Empire. And there's a, there's a magnificent, like, cinematic battle that happens where the Turks are trying to, like, they lay siege to his palace in order to get him to leave or kill him, you know? And his men fight room to room while the palace is burning down all around them. And they only get captured when having defeated the police that have, the, the military police that have charged into the castle and lit it on fire to try to get him out, They've defeated those guys and they go attacking the other cops, the other police, the other military outside laying siege to the city. That was Charles XII. That's why you write about Charles XII because Charles XII is. And then Charles XII will invent Swedish meatballs having left slash escaped Turkey. He brings those, those you know balls of lamb meat back with him to Sweden, they put it with a Swedish ingredient sauce, and boom, you get Swedish meatballs. So instead of that, Tsar Peter defeats Sweden, becomes Peter the Great, and begins conquering the Euro Turkish provinces in Ukraine and the Balkans. Later on, the Turks, the Austrians will crush the Turks in Central Europe, the British and the French will help the Greeks and Arabs revolt, and the Ottoman become the sick man of Europe. The great question is not, will the Turks conquer the world? It's who will conquer the Turks? Will it be the British, the French, or the Russians? All three had a claim. So the Ottoman Empire by 1800 was rural, poor, undereducated, religiously conservative, against change. Notice how that happened. It's badly led and incapable of reform. The army won't allow reforms because that would hurt its own privileges. So when the Ottoman were poor and wanted to capture Constantinople, they were willing to change. But having gotten rich, having beaten up their enemies, they became conservative and they didn't want to change. And because they didn't change, they didn't keep up. Ottoman imperial provinces generated little income, no industrialization. The Turks mostly start selling raw materials and opium. That's not a way of making a lot of money. That's not the crossroads of the world. That's not Chinese silk or spices. That's not Indian tea or luxury goods. 
increasingly they're dependent on European manufactured goods. They increasingly are selling opium and wheat and barley in exchange for stuff European factories are making. So the question is not if the Ottoman Empire will survive, much less conquer the world. The real question is who will take it over? Will it be Russia, uh, who presents itself as a savior to the Orthodox Christians of Constantinople? Will it be Britain, the mistress of the seas? This question will lead to the Crimean War in the 1850s, the Suez Canal in the 1880s, World War I, the Armenian Genocide, ethnic wars in the Balkans throughout the 1920s into the 1990s, and the colonization by Britain and France of the Middle East. In short, the, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the death of the Ottoman Empire, plays a huge role in the mass murder we're going to talk about in part two of our course. Thank you.